Welcome to Clothing Culture, a fashion industry podcast at the intersection of technology and innovation. I'm Emily Lane. And I'm Brett Schnitger. We speak with experts and disruptors who are moving the industry forward. And discuss solutions to real industry challenges. Clothing Culture is brought to you by Stars Design Group, a global design and production house with more than 30 years of experience. Welcome back to another episode of Clothing Culture. I am so excited about today's conversation because we are bringing back a favorite, Keenan Dufty, uh, to this to this conversation. We had a conversation with him earlier this season, actually, uh, as we talked about the fluidity of f- the fashion system, and we had a big deep dive into the uh, vibrancy of the art and fashion scene in Kyiv. And obviously a lot has happened since that conversation that we captured back in October after their their big fashion season. And we thought, you know, this might be a really good time to bring your, your perspective back to the table, kind of explore what's going on. And I know you've got some some wonderful things underway. So welcome, Kina. Keenan. Oh my gosh. <laughs> welcome, Keenan. <laughs> you, you can call me Keenan. I answer yeah. anything. I, I answer it any and every it is happy hour. Or, or, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, lo- it's lovely to be back. It's lovely to see you again. And obviously, we've, we've seen each other in the meantime, which is, yes. uh, which is a whole other story. Um, but yeah, we've, uh, I mean, w- w- what a, uh, you know, a, a, a ton of events since uh, we met, um, you know, last year, um, at the end yeah. of last year. And, you know, I, I kind of just come back from Kiev Art and Fashion Days. And, you know, I was very sort of... Uh, enthusiastic about what I'd seen there in terms of the creativity mm-hmm. and the people I met and the food and the culture and, you know, everything about the city and completely unaware of, of the events that were going to, you know, sort of uh, happen. Uh, I mean, it, it, saying events that have happened, Putin invaded Ukraine mm-hmm. and yeah. there's a war, there's devastation, there's looks like war crimes now. Um, right. You know, I mean, uh, absolute terror and, and destruction. And was there any uh, undercurrent when you were there about any of this? Would would did anyone have any of this fear of of this happening when you were there? That I mean, I, when I look back now, I sort of think that you could sort of feel a, a you could feel something, but I, I think it's just kind of retrospective. Sure. You know, um, uh, speculation. I, I, yeah. There was not certainly nothing. There was certainly no indication. But um, you know, remnants of the Soviet era are obviously very prevalent in in Ukraine. Wasn't and Kiev it, capital it, it, of old Russia? If I remember, there was this. Oh, I don't know. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I, yeah. you know I don't. I don't know my history of of Ukraine at all. Um, there, there was. So, there's a definite connection there, and maybe one of the reason yeah. that he, he is wants going to after lay it. claim to what's mm-hmm. not yeah. his. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and the, the you know the the sh- sort of shock to the 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 world was that actually he he invaded. I mean, it, you know, lining mm. up tens of thousands of troops, and you know, I, I think right until, I mean, I heard you know Roger Waters of Pink Floyd saying, "Oh, they're not going to invade," and then they invaded. You know, um, we all probably thought that. You know, we thought it was a bold move to line up troops on the border, but we thought this was just kind of bristling because no one would be yeah. literally mad enough to right. to do that. You know, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that he is. The, you know, the, the the sort of the the in in the context of the relatively young creative people that I met and the things that I heard about the cultural changes that were underway in in Ukraine. For instance, they had their sort of first uh, uh, Pride Week, um, with uh, I was told around 7,000 participants. So, you know, the LGBTQ community were getting some level of visibility. And that was certainly true in some of the uh, contemporary art and visual arts that I saw. That was very much the, the sort of messaging of, of the LGBT community was, was part of the, um, the, the sort of contemporary art scene. And it felt fresh, exciting. Um, you know, it felt like a city that really had a, 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 di- a dynamic um, 
uh, the, the sort of dynamism of of Berlin, and I know that's said a lot in the media that you know Kiev was was potentially the next Berlin. Um, so it's a bit of a cliche to say that, but it actually did feel like that. And I think I mentioned in our in our uh, last podcast that the folks that own Bergheim, the um, the techno club in Berlin, were actually in in Kiev at the same time looking for a venue to open their second uh, location, and they'd chosen Kiev because there's a big techno scene in in Ukraine. Um, and they thought that was like the next next natural habitat, you know, for uh, for Bergheim. And, and it, it, it's kind of really amazing that only literally weeks later, that, that yeah. this was all the all this promise was just dashed. And, and you know, mm-hmm. who, who knows where ultimately it's going to go? Um, yeah, but I got to tell you, look at at you know, out of the ashes comes these amazing stories of heroism yeah. and standing up for the country. I think. We've all gotten so comfortable in our lifestyles and we, you know, and the world is so connected. So we're kind of living that in yeah. in a way, distantly, never feeling the pain that they are, certainly. But yeah. amazing stories today of people standing up for, for their country. And you kind of wonder, would that happen everywhere? What, what I found amazing is the resilience of the creative community there, the, the designers that I'm in touch with. Um, you know, and, and particularly, I mean, I won't name names other than uh, Sofia Chikonia, who's the founder of, of Kiev Art and Fashion Days. And Sofia is, actually lives in Tbilisi. She's, she's Georgian. And she immediately went to the Polish border and was helping uh, oh, uh, Ukrainian great. refugees. And, um, you know, she's very invested in Ukraine. She says her second home. And spiritually, she's very connected with it. Uh, but then as I've been staying in contact with Many of the designers that I met through Instagram mainly because that's really been the, the, the main resource. Uh, some have, have left. Uh, one of the designers that I know is, is came to New York and then is now based in, in Los Angeles for the, for the near future. Another is, is in Paris, has moved to Paris with her team and is sort of setting up there and trying to continue there. Uh, others, uh, uh, the the the, the uh, male designers are stuck in Ukraine yeah, sure. because mm-hmm. you know, they, they, yeah, and and I, I know one of them has actually been sort of conscripted, um, yeah. and so, but it's amazing the resilience that everyone has. Uh, even the designer who's been conscripted, that h- him or his team are still communicating with me and posting. Uh, you know, illustration, fashion illustrations, and creative. Wow. Uh, you know, expre- creative expression. Um, so I think that what what Putin's failing to do is actually destroy the spirit of the people. And it, it, it's you know, culture is so important in society. I think one of the things that we can say is that you know, if you take culture away from society, it's so diminished. Um, you know, and I, I, I'd been right after the invasion happened. I thought to myself, "What can I do?" And you know, I, I immediately started working on a project, and th- that was to stage a fashion show with Ukrainian designers. And one of the sort of nagging thoughts in the back of my mind was, you know, the the, the criticism could be, "Why are you wasting time and energy and money on staging a fashion show when that those resources could go towards?" humanitarian aid and so on. And while I do see that there's absolute validity in that, it, it, it's culture. You know, culture is, is an art and creativity are ways that we remain human, even in the mm-hmm. worst situation. And so I do think it's important to maintain that expression. And, and I do feel that I know it's uplifting the designers that I've, I've been in contact with, and it's uplifting their spirits. And as they say to me, this is... A, a boost for the Ukrainian fashion system, um, you know. So I think it, I think it is important to always remember that. You know, if you think about, I mean, I've been reading the you know the war poets, Rupert Brooke and mm-hmm. and, and, and and Siegfried Sassoon and so on. I mean, going back to like you know the First World War and looking at that poetry, reading that poetry, because they, these were young men who were on the front line and who were talking about the realities of war. Um, you know, and, and not pulling punches in any way. Yeah. Um, but their art and their creativity were sort of many fold. They were, they, were, they were telling people back home about the horrors of war and the realities of war, but also that, that, um, that art, that culture uh, kind of maintained a certain degree of humanity, even in the, in the horrors of that, you know, absolute war, war to end all wars, as it was known as. 
Yeah. Um, so I do think it's important to remember that in these times. I, I agree. You know, art has played such a key role in helping people uh, process trauma and, again, showcase, really tell the story and connect that with the rest of the world. Um, you know, with, with, with tragedy often comes some of the great, the finest art. So, And I think uh, we in the, you know, in the apparel space or in general, they don't really associate directly designers of clothing with artists, but they just, we've talked about in previous episodes, you know, they paint their stories in cloth as others would mm -hmm. in paintbrush. And I remember, you know, this brings this point where I was doing a senior project at one of the universities here and there was an Israeli student. And, you know, the story she told through her garments about, you know, life in Israel, the challenges that existed, it was... It was, I was awestruck. It, it, was, it was a complete story built into garments. And I, and I, and I have to imagine that what we're going to see and as, as a distillation at this show is the shift of the reality of war that comes into it. They're artists, so they're going to tell these stories. They're going to draw in the, the, you know, the artistry of what's going on, but tell the story of the change within Ukraine, like every artist would. Mm -hmm. And I think that's critical to tell the story in different mediums. And I think it's, I think it also provides hope. I think, mm -hmm. you know, what you're doing by doing this is one, continuing to raise the, uh, the, the eyes of visibility because, you know, as humans, we can only take so much catastrophe if we're not in the middle of it. At one point, to preserve kind of our sanity, the human, the brain wants to shut down and, I, and, and kind of dismiss it. And I think we can't let this go. We can't sideline this. It's got to be in the front of everybody's mindset. Yeah. So there's this ongoing conversation and that's what you're doing here, telling it right. through Right. Yeah. So why don't you tell us um, a little bit more specifics on exactly what it is you're developing to help tell these stories and and foster hope? Yeah. So the, on the 25th of February, so, so the invasion began on the 24th. So on the 25th, I, I kind of, you know, woke up that day and I thought, you know, what can I do? And my first thought was, what about trying to put together a show of some kind at New York Fashion Week in September? Now, I know that seems like it's a long way off. and it, It's not. You know, <laughs> and, and at that moment, actually, th th that invasion, you know, it, you could have seen it ending within a few days. Um, you know, there the, 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 the could have been a response of, uh, you know, Ukrainian military laying down their arms and, and submitting to Putin. So, yeah. um, you know, this, this was a little bit ab of an abstract thought, but I, I, I did believe that even though September is, you know, months away, um, it, would, it would actually allow time to organize something. And um, I was actually amazed by how quickly things fell into place because the first thing I did was contact the CFDA, Council of Fashion Designers of America. I asked uh, the, the uh, executive director and the, the vice president there, Stephen Kolb and Lisa Smiler, um, if they would be able to uh, assist in some way. And they immediately said, yes, we'll help you with uh, the fashion calendar, which is essentially what they run. They run the fashion calendar, which gives uh, timings to the shows in, in New York City. And it's important to be on that because that's what, how the media and the press know where and when shows are happening. Um, so being part of the calendar is really important. They also said they would help the designers to um, promote their work through a thing called Runway 360. Mm. And um, now it's going to get a little confusing because there are two entities called Runway involved in this. One is Runway 360, which is the CFDA promotional portal. Um, so once I had CFDA's endorsement, and I'm a member, I've been a member for 15 years, and uh, so I did feel that was kind of a, 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 cr a credibility factor. Uh, so once I had their endorsement, I actually then went to an organization called Runway 7, which uh, rents Sony Hall, which is a, um, <laughs> a, a space just off uh, uh, Times Square during New York Fashion Week, and they stage a whole bunch of, of runway shows. And I went to the founders of, the, of that, uh, that, that organization, and I said, look, I would like to stage some fashion shows for uh, Ukrainian designers if I can get them to come over to New York 
um, would you be willing to support that in some way? And they said, yes, we will donate a runway show uh, for, let's say, six designers. So each designer has three or four looks and it builds out into a nice kind of, you know, 15, 20 minute runway show. Yeah. And that, that, that space also includes uh, full support in production. So obviously lighting, audio, hair, makeup, um, the, 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 uh, the sort of back of house production, if you like. Uh, so everything's in place. So all the designers need to do is turn up with looks and you know they 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 have everything kind of set up for them so that was a big piece then the next step was to go to a uh, find a way to publicize this so i went to a friend of mine james laforce who runs uh, laforce pr which is one of the uh, preeminent fashion prs in new york and james immediately said anything you want we'll do whatever you want That's you can great. use our space to do dressing and fitting and so on we'll do front of house we'll we'll do the you know invite mailing and all that uh, that stuff so um on the day of show they kind of you know seat everyone before the show they're mailing invites and so on and so forth and and as the designers turn up in new york then they uh they're allowing uh, the designers to have space to do fittings and so on so those three bits were really, really key. Um, I then uh, spoke to some industry friends like Tommy Hilfiger, who immediately offered, uh, you know, support. Um, my friend Constance White, who is a really f- sort of foremost fashion journalist, uh, got in touch with Condé Nast and, and, and sort of enlisted their support. Uh, um, Kay Unger, who's the uh, former president of the Board of Parsons got involved and she introduced me to a number of other uh, sort of fashion industry connections of hers, one of which led to uh, MasterCard getting involved. So oh, MasterCard wow. are actually donating a space uh, post-show. So after the, the day after the show, they're donating a space that's called their Tech Hub. And that's on Fifth Avenue at Lower Fifth, close to Union Square, so that designers are able to have press appointments and meet the media, do sales appointments and so on, and actually tell their stories in person, which I think will be very, very important because they'll, they have personal backstories. Obviously, they're going to talk about their collections and their design businesses and so on, but they'll have you know, backstories about the invasion and how they, they coped with that. Um, how they maintain their businesses, where they move to, and so on and so forth. And I think that is the big part of this, is that storytelling aspect. So, you know, even though coming back to um, what I said earlier, where, you know, Fashion Week in September is, is months away, but the story is evolving, and that will be a point at which these individuals will be able to tell that story. Um, so, you know, the, the, the bits that we still have to fill in are uh, the, the travel and accommodation. And they're two areas that, because of the pandemic, hospitality and the airline industry have been the most impacted. Um, mm. But we have, you know, solutions for that. Um, I was trying to do this whole thing without involving money in any way. Um, because going back to, you know, what I said earlier about a potential criticism being, why are you spending money on a fashion show when money could go towards humanitarian aid? And so I was sort of trying to do this with favors and goodwill. Um, But it may come down to us having to purchase flights and purchase hotel rooms in order to, you know, make this a seamless experience for the designers. I don't want them to uh, incur any costs whatsoever. Uh, I want this to be, you know, a a, a situation where they can be brought in, uh, they can be they can be housed. Um, all of the uh, production for the show and the static show can be taken care of. They don't have to think about anything. They just have to bring uh, the assets that they have, which may be three or four looks from a collection. Um, it could be a new collection or it might be something retrospective and themselves and their stories. And, and that, I think, would be, you know, a, a, a powerful message. Um, and and it, th- this, this story is ongoing. It's evolving. Uh, I hope that, you know, the the invasion and the aftermath are resolved by September, um, but who knows? Mm -hmm. Um, So we we, we just have to, uh, you know, keep going with positive force. And um, all of the designers that I'm in contact with them all using Instagram, and they all, without uh, exception, have said, this is such an uplifting endeavour. And they're very, you know, they're very grateful, they're very supportive, and, and they've only had positive things to say about it. So I think, you know, it, it, it was the right endeavour 
and um, w we've we've been able to garner really great support and goodwill from the fashion industry. Anybody who says the fashion industry is full of shallow people who don't care about anything else, you know, if, if you're know in my shoes, yeah. you know, in the week the week after the invasion, it was it was it was just yes from everyone. What do you That's need? Wonderful. What can you do? Um, you know, so I think uh, you know w w there's a lot of good people in this industry. Yeah, and I would say, you know, I make one statement that should be obvious is that I think you can do both. Mm -hmm. I think the world is coming together to provide funds for uh, Ukraine in a ton of different ways. I mean, I think people are engaged. But I think investing in this has a lot of very important messages. Outside of the ones we discussed, too, we're also putting a face to the conflict. There will be this direct, visible human being with a name and a story. And I think we, as again, as human beings, if you don't have a face, you don't have a name, it's not as real. I think you putting a face and a name and, you know, a life in front of more people in the U.S., it's going to continue to drive build the ground connection. well and build connections. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, is there, a, is there things we can do as a community to help support and overcome some of those last minute obstacles? Do you have a Yeah, it doesn't seem like that or, many, you've got six designers, if, I'm, if, I, if yeah. I remember, and probably some yeah. of their teams. So how, like, how many rooms and airline tickets are, are, are you needing? And, you know, it seems like you're so close at this point. Yeah, we're, we're very close. I mean, and, and, and Sophia Chaconia, you know, I spoke to her about it initially and I said, you know, we're going to need, you know, six designers plus, you know, maybe an assistant or, or you know, the, the, the you know, the, the, the sort of right-hand person, whatever. And I obviously wanted, Sophia, I want Sophia to be curating this mm -hmm. um, and to be, uh, you know, front facing because the reason why I went to Ukraine is because Sophia invited me and I wouldn't have had any awareness of the the reality of the creative scene in Ukraine had, had that not happened. Um, you know, and, and Sophia is a very altruistic person. She was immediately saying, no, I don't need an airline ticket or a hotel. I'll take care of myself, you know, but let's just focus on the designers. So I would say, you know, between sort of 10 and 12 uh, tickets, rooms. Um, I, I mean, I had some of the folks that I'm working with immediately said, well, I've got a spare bedroom. Right. Can you, come and stay? Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it was yeah. immediately, you know, and, and certainly, you know, my wife and I, we have a spare bedroom. Somebody could yeah. come and stay with us too. However, I know what it's like when you go and do a show or you go and do a trade show overseas. You kind of want to come home to your own space and close yeah. the door right. and, and switch off and, and, and decompress a little bit. And staying in someone else's home is fine, but I, I want, it, want it to be as seamless as possible for them, knowing yeah. that they may be coming from a difficult situation. Yeah, you know, right. it, it, whether they're in Ukraine or in France or in, in you know, the West Coast of America, they may be sort of couch surfing or, you know, I, I sort of want them to come to New York Fashion Week and have a real New York Fashion Week experience uh, yeah. and not sort of just be getting by. Yeah. Um, because I think the show and everything around the show is going to be of a New York City Fashion Week production level. And, you know, it's very important to, I think, for all aspects to have that. So just telling the story, you know, it's amazing how um, people step forward and say, oh, well, you know, I can do this, I can do yeah. that. Um, you know, so I think, you know, f f to answer your question, uh, helping to tell the story I I is amazing because that's, uh, you know, a great way that we get responses from the airline industry, from the hospitality industry and so on. Is there a place um, to I direct people's goodwill? I mean, do we have a site or a contact that you can share where we can upload it yeah, to so the... We don't have a site yet, but I mean, people can message me directly. Perfect. You know, they can find me on Instagram. They can message me uh, through Gmail. It's just my name, Keenan Dufty at Gmail. It's very, very easy. Um, I'm working directly with, so I mentioned Kay Unger, uh, Constance White, and then also another friend of mine, Mary Gelhar, who was, was the fashion director of Gen Art, which was an organization that promoted emerging talent in the 90s and in the 2000s. And that's kind of how I got my start back in the 90s, was doing a group show with Gen Art. So uh, Mary got involved because Gen Art was, it, it was a not-for-profit, and they have a lot of expertise in actually 
um, finding these kind of supports. So she put together a proposal for the hotel industry, and it's just a question of us getting out there to, you know, Hyatt or Marriott and, and, and finding contacts within those organisations where we can actually cut straight to, you know, the heart of the matter yeah, and, and, right. and not have to, you know, be, be kind of playing the round robin of emailing this person, somebody that, that I don't know, you know, or that I don't have a connection with is, is much more difficult than somebody who I can, can have, a, a, you know, an, an introduction to. So um, that's what yeah. I would say. If, the, if, you know, anyone listening, if you have contacts in the hospitality industry, please, you know, DM me, um, send me an email. And if you, if you feel comfortable to make an introduction, that would be great. And, you know, we can kind of go forward from there. Great. I think it's exciting. I got one last question because, you know, Keenan Dufty, the designer, is also Keenan Dufty, the musician. And you mentioned some really exciting groups that you heard in Ukraine. Yeah, well, actually, Surrounding one Key Fashion Week. There was one that yeah. I remember that you were really thought yeah, was very, was, very innovative. I mean, I heard a lot of good music. Um, that, so uh, there's a, a designer... A label called Lake Studio, and they are probably the most commercially, the, the broadest, most commercially successful label uh, that's operating out of Kiev right now. And when I arrived in Kiev, the first event that we went to, actually the second event we went to, we went to a designer uh, called Gudu who had a traditional runway show that was fabulous. And then we went to this old theatre and it was very sort of mysterious. We kind of went in, it was an old wood panelled theatre with all of these pictures of um, you know, sort of almost like vintage. I mean, they're probably very, very famous actors in Ukraine, but, you know, I didn't really know who they were, but um, they lined the walls, a bit like Sardis or something like that, you know, when you mm-hmm. go into that kind of environment. And then we went into a theatre and the fashion show was actually a, a, a group of uh, female musicians called Dark Daughters, and that's yes, spelled D A H K. Yeah. yeah, and they're kind of like uh, gyp- gypsy punk, I guess I would describe them as. Um, so they were wearing Lake Studios collection, and they were changing as they were performing. So they're oh playing that's amazing. accordion, they're playing <laughs> wow. piano, and they're almost like an Amy Winehouse approach where they have this traditional gypsy-infused music but with very contemporary, like I would almost describe it as hip-hop lyrics, you know, so very confrontational, um, very uh, um, uh, uh, contemporary. And the one song that I I really remember is a song called Makeup, where they start the the performance by, uh, they have these illuminated mirrors and they make themselves up in a kind of an overly, almost like grotesque, uh, version of the stereotypical, you know, female makeup with the, the r- extremely oh, red yes. cheeks, very red sort of slashed lips, um, you know, heavy eye makeup with a very, very white face. And um, the lyrics are, you know, partly Ukrainian, partly, I mean, obviously the chorus, which was makeup, 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 is, is in <laughs> English, so I, I kind of got that bit. Um, but the performance was amazing. And, uh, you know, I was actually, like, dying to collaborate with them in some... I mean, they don't need me to collaborate with them, but... But Keenan, you know, the musicians, so, I see that. You know, you've, you've yeah. had so many different things that are so experimental that... Yeah, that I mean, it was... So great. It was um, there's a, there's a, a, a sort of gypsy punk uh, group out of New York called Gogol, Gogol Bordello, and uh, Eugene Hutz is the singer, and he was famously in some Madonna video and movie, I think, too, um, and he's kind of an East Village guy with a, you know, a very elaborate mustache and, and, and very good looking. And, um, and Dark Daughters reminded me of that kind of performance in that yeah. there were, you know, six, seven, eight people in, in the band. Uh, the drummer kept jumping on top of the bass drum and wow. almost falling. All, you know, the, whole, the yeah. whole performance was very choreographed, but it looked spon- completely spontaneous. And um, really amazing. I mean, you know, it's kind of like Iggy. It was like seeing it. The best performer I've ever seen is Iggy Pop. Right. And without doubt. It was like, I mean, I never saw James Brown. I'm sure James Brown was, was you know, better than Iggy Pop, I'm sure. But Iggy's the most visceral and, like, animalistic performer. There's, like, a, the reality to it. It's dangerous because you just don't know what he's going to do. And I saw him in the 90s and he was already, I guess in the 90s, he was probably in his 50s by then. And he was leaping off of speaker stacks and jumping into the audience and, you know, really Physical. behaving dangerously. Physical, yeah. completely <laughs> animalistic. 
Yeah. You know? um, and, and Dark Daughters were like that. They, there was no pretense. There was no um, uh, sort of barrier. They were, I mean, I was sitting in the front row and the accordion player was literally in my face. Wow, you know, that's and it great. Was amazing. It was an amazing performance. Great. So much fun. How energizing. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you are creating. I, we, we both think it's just an absolutely wonderful, uh, a wonderful project and with, layered with meaning and opportunity. And uh, thank you for doing this. And of course, you know, we want to help. And, yeah, sure. and uh, right, anybody who you. reaches out, we will pass yeah. them along to you. So yeah. uh, you always have your hands in, in, in wonderful things, Keenan. Um, Thank you for doing this. And also I want to share a congratulations on your recent show. Um, you had oh, a, you. an incredible retrospective, Rebel Rebel in Palm Spring this last spring. And wow, we were just blown away by seeing- That was so much The fun. history of your collections. Yeah. What a treat. <laughs> so I'm sure that what you are developing here will have the same kind of impact. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to put it together and stay out of the way. It's, you know, it's really- uh, the, the, the you know the designers' uh, creative expression, their message, their story, and so on. I'm just sort of trying to be the uh, behind the scenes facilitator, and um, as long as they want it, you know, and and, and they do. Um, that's the other thing. When you put together something like this, you want to be respectful of, you know, the the the, the, the sort of other side it, that they actually want this. You know? Oh my God, um, the opportunity! Right. <laughs> but they, yeah. they they do, and they, and I think we're all of the same spirit with yeah. this endeavor. And uh, so that's, that's the good thing. Yeah, fashion's got to be inclusive and always. Yeah. And we talked about yeah. that the last, you know, this whole, the, the world of fashion has expanded to having these fashion weeks all over the world and to bring, bring them into kind of a key fashion area and give them face and visibility. That's hopeful in a time that people need hope. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Keenan, and uh, wonderful to have a conversation with you again. And of course, we can't wait for the next one. <laughs> right, cheers, cheers, mate. Cheers. Thank you. Take care. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. For those out there, make sure to subscribe to stay apprised of upcoming episodes of Clothing Culture. <laughs>